Hello everybody and welcome to the Gyrocopter Flying Club and our continuing series, The History of the Gyroplane. In part 6 we look at the aftermath of crashes that ended the hopes of many in the gyroplane market and took the public over a decade to forget. Given the news flow of the day, the high profile crashes of 69-70 affected the UK more than the US, although geographics aside the two markets had become quite different, which in some ways protected the US. Partly because it wasn't invented here and the lack of a natural countryman affinity to Benson, the UK had for some years tried to innovate and develop aircraft in a drive for performance, as well as having the motivation to create own product that could be exploited for the obvious growing market. The US market, on the other hand, had been to this point reasonably faithful to Benson product. Business-wise, the size of the US territory also meant there was enough dealer opportunity to stick with Benson rather than go off-piste and develop something of your own. There were others, Ken Brock being notable, but we will look at him in the next episode. And there was development, but another major factor was that Benson had started to get distracted from his core product into trying to develop a cheap helicopter with the motivation to upsell the concept and so giving the ability of current owners to convert existing aircraft. By 1973, he'd flown this, the model B8H, H for hovering. It was powered by two separate engines. One drove coaxial rotors, the other the conventional pusher prop. It came after our accidents, but the development was years prior and it clearly shows the thinking of Benson at the time. An interesting element of this photograph is that it shows that this aircraft, even though it's flying in 1973, still has the hanging stick. In the US, the accident rate was still fairly horrific. One study revealed that from 1967 to January 69, 46 gyrocopter accidents occurred, including 28 involving serious injury or death, 34 involved Benson or modified Benson equipment. Of all the accidents, 25 were attributed to improper operation, 9 to structural failure, 6 to engine failure. The majority of pilots had 8 hours or less in gyrocopters, where a student pilot anyway has just to demonstrate 3 takeoffs and landings in a towed gyroglider. It may be endorsed by any CFI whether or not he's ever flown a gyrocopter himself or, for that matter, even seen one. Likewise with the inspector issuing the aircraft permit, and engine failures were common due to second-hand engines being used with very unknown histories, and the need for high-octane fuel with specific two-stroke oil mix, and naturally, in a budget aircraft, these, these things are often likely to be sacrificed. So all this death and destruction was comfortably explainable, and if you did things right, it was never going to happen to you. In the UK, there was an almost equally relaxed attitude to pilot training, and of course the fact Ernie Brooks was a garage owner flying his aerial beach buggy, it gave an equally warm feeling. Campbell Aircraft were also keen to highlight in Flight Magazine that the Brooklyn's Mosquito was a modified version of their Benson product with a host of non-standard parts. In modern parlance, Ernie Brooks was thrown under the bus. The accident to Ken Wallace's WA-117 wasn't going to give anybody any comfort. It happened at the world's biggest air show, in front of thousands and television cameras. It had been aggressively publicised and was flown by a 6,800 hour company test pilot who had also been an ex-RAF war hero. John Peewee Judge was so respected that the following edition of Flight Magazine dedicated multiple pages to his obituary. But perhaps more damning than all of that was the cult status afforded to Ken Wallace. Cult is a funny thing, but when cult fails, it shatters those who believed. Ken held on to that line that he would never sell his aircraft to the public but today the forgotten caveat was in kit form, because of course the Wallace aircraft were to be sold. He had already sold the WA-116 previously, 
one to a flying school in the UK. Given the unique circumstance of manufacturer, the pilot, the event, and the level of high quality evidence, the AAIB not only had a lot of pressure to get answers, but they had a lot of material to work with. They did their usual thorough job and did a lot of analysis on the dynamics of gyroplane flight that had never been done before. But the report took over four years to produce and the damage had already been done. The gyroplane in the UK would never recover. 